praise you, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity to open the word tonight and to uh, share in the word and God to be spoken through by your word. Lord, as we enter into this study, Father, I just I pray that uh, there be no hindrances uh, in our mind, our will, or our emotions that would hinder us from receiving what you have to speak tonight. Lord, we, we rebuke any hindrances and we just lose the spirit and the presence of, of God, of the Holy Spirit to be here with us tonight, alive in this word, alive within our hearts and alive uh, in the homes of those watching this evening or will watch. Father God, may you speak something tonight through me uh, that brings life to someone watching and listening in Jesus' name. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. <clears throat> as I was praying and as I was seeking the Lord on what to, what to talk about tonight, the Lord's been doing something really heavy in me as of recently and speaking a lot to me um, about what it is really to um, acquire revival. And if any of you know me, you know that that's kind of what I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a revivalist. Uh, I, I come to, uh, to, to wake wake people up. I come to wake up the church and, and get us activated in the calling of God and into the calling God would have us to be in our community. And so when I, when I get into some of these scriptures, um, and especially the Lord has really given me just such a, a mandate to speak some truth that, um, that, I would, that I believe that the Lord would want us to see and it's a truth that we don't often hear much about anymore and I would say maybe the title of this message would be death to self um, if we're ever going to reach revival if we're ever going to reach that phase um, we have to know uh, that it takes something dead to be revived and when we seek revival Revival only comes through, through trial and through ultimate death. And it's our death in Christ that gets us to that place. I'm, I'm speaking slow tonight because I don't want to get myself excited and start preaching. I've got to teach a Bible study tonight. And, um, so I'm, I'm limiting myself uh, currently, and we'll see how this goes. But um, if we're talking about death to self, and we, we look across... We look across the body of Christ as a whole, and what we see, and what we could, uh, and I'll be very frank with you tonight, as I typically am, what we see is a body mostly without power. We see a world that suffers because of our lack of power, our lack of the Spirit of God moving through these vessels. On my way here, on Route 4, I passed a baseball field that you couldn't find a parking space in that baseball complex. There was probably seven or eight baseball diamonds out there, and the place was packed. Then we look around, right? I'm just going to step right in it. And then we look around today. You want to see the temperature of your church or your current body? You hold a prayer meeting or a midweek Bible study. It'll pack out here on Sunday because it's convenient for most people, and I'm just going to be very honest. You may never ask me to come back and teach Bible study again. It's convenient that they show up on Sunday because there's not much open at that time in the morning, so they figure, we'll just go to church then. And we wonder why there's no power. I wonder why the diamonds are full tonight and the church house is seemingly empty. I knew it because I've, I've been in Wednesday night services in my own church, and there's, it's a ghost town. Midweek services are a ghost town, but yet we suffer the most in the middle of the week. We call it hump day because we want to get beyond it because we know the weekend's coming. We want to get up the hill, and we want to get down. We know that it wears on us through the, through the week. But yet, when trials do come, we, we pray that Christ moves in for us, but yet we do not give him the time to do it. We're full of ourselves. In Luke 9, 23 and 24, the Bible reads, and we're going to really be in Romans, but I want a couple scriptures ahead of this. And Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, 
it says then he said to them all if anyone would come after me that is to be his disciple that is to operate in his name that is to be in his covering if anyone is to come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me as Jesus is saying he must take up not my cross but his own cross it says for whosoever wants to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for me will save it in Matthew 10 and 38 it says anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me the scary part is that I know Resurrection Sunday is right around the corner. We've called it Easter for so long, and then we realize we probably shouldn't call it Easter anymore because of what it stood for and what it was rooted in. So we call it Resurrection Sunday. We still celebrate with eggs and this and that, but we still call it Resurrection Sunday. Very rarely do we see churches celebrating Passover the way that we should. But we call it Resurrection Sunday. We love to celebrate the death and the life of Christ. And that is a good thing. I believe that we should remember that. We take communion, and he says uh, to do this in remembrance of me. And part of that communion is remembering the body that was broken and the blood that was shed uh, for our sins, for our well-being, for our further progress of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love to celebrate his death. And we love that he hung on a cross for us. But what we don't love to do is carry our own cross and die on our own cross and put our own lives on hold for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are creatures of habit and creatures of the flesh. And ultimately, if we're ever going to progress in our spiritual walk as an individual follower of Christ, we must die to self. Our self has to to be crucified our will must be his our wants should be on the cross our desires should be on the cross our lust should be on their on the cross our feelings must be crucified our personal hopes our personal dreams our expectations must go by the way of the cross daily as, as I was reading in the Amplified Version, I don't have that for us tonight. The idea of one denying themselves is to ultimately render themselves to the cause of Christ. Is to give my, I want to give myself to what Christ has for me so I can fulfill all that he died for me to fulfill. If I put any of myself in the way of that, it brings a hindrance to what he wants to do in my life. He will not overtake that. We have to understand. He will not put himself in that position to take my will away from me. And I find it, I find it all too common that a large portion of the body of Christ seems to think that he's going to do that. We seem to think that one day we're going to wake up and one day we're going to step out in the calling and, and Christ has paved the way and has put us on righteous, solid ground, and we can just go. There's a process of death that has to take place before that happens, and it's on our end. It's, it's up to us to do that. It's up to us to willfully put ourselves in that position. When Jesus was going to the cross, when he was in the garden that night, he knew what was coming. What did he say? He said, it's not my will, but your will be done. If, if, I, if, this, if I should drink of this cup, and let it not pass for me. Your will, not my will. What I see happening is there's a lot of our will being played out today. I was praying before I came in tonight. and I have this list. It's a, it's a prayer list. It's a, it's a walk that we do through Dayton. What I have here from January 1st to March 10th, there's pages and pages of fatalities and violent crimes. We go to these addresses.
where these things happen and, and we pray and we pray ultimately somebody was somewhere they shouldn't have been and they were going after themselves they were they were they were putting their own will into place and ultimately they died in the wrong way they need us Lafayette they they need us to be in their presence with a with a, a motive and agenda that's not ours but Christ's and a motive and agenda that brings life not and, and life to give I I do not walk this walk Christ did not produce miracles for himself he did not turn stones into bread he did not call down an army of angels to get him off the cross or to save his life. He did not do these things. He did not do one miracle for himself. But everything that he did was for other people, was for us. If we think that any part of this walk is for me, then we are wrong. Because we have to deny ourselves every day so that he may be glorified through us. Bible study last night, we're teaching on the miracles and how the miracles glorify God. And ultimately, in order for miracles to glorify God, his spirit has to flow through us. If there are things within us that his spirit does not mingle well with, it will not flow through us. It may bump around and hit us and zig and zag, but it's not going to flow the way that it should flow. And we can't produce the miracles for somebody else if we don't have what's good inside of us living. There's a, and what I want you to know is there is a miracle in you tonight for somebody else. And what do we put in the way of that for somebody else is ultimately ourself. That has to die. That has to go. In Romans chapter 6, it says this. We're talking about what it is when we are, are dead in Christ and we raise with Christ with resurrection Sunday right around the corner. It reads in Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I want you to note here in verse 2, this is the first time it tells us no. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, just in two scriptures. Many would say that the Old Testament is really hard and hard to live by. But when we go through the, when we go through the New Testament, which everybody seems to hold on to, is their, their ticket to do what they, what they want to do with their life and to live how they want to live and that Jesus is going to love me anyway and, 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 and you're not the judge of me and this we use a lot of these excuses because the New Testament in area seems like it provides us a way to function in grace but yet live how we want to live and in verse 1 and 2 right out of the gates in Romans it shoots that whole idea down it says that we are not to operate in sin and under grace he says, God forbid that you should do that. And what is sin? Sin separates us from God. Sin is to know to do good and not to do it. To do what is righteous and holy and not to do it. That is sin. And that looks like a lot of different things. We know we... Uh, we, we get spoken to through conviction the Holy Spirit lets us know and there are some things we should know better and I digress on that point know ye not that so many of us in verse 3 were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death you see the baptism is a public funeral when we Baptized people. Last year we baptized 155 people on the streets of Dayton. We have a big uh, trailer with a baptismal on it. We towed it around, and when we 
do our tent revivals and our street ministries. We, people get saved, we want them to get baptized right away. And we say, this is a public funeral. What goes down under that water is dying. But what comes up in sim symbolically is alive. And is a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Because as he died, as we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we take on his death. But praise God, we also take on his resurrection. But therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. This is telling us that we should not live the same way post-salvation that we do pre-salvation. Something has to change. And you know it's not changed if you're living the same way that you've been living. Something has to change. That old me is done. When I accepted Christ at the altar, I knew that I was to never go back living the way that I was. <clears throat> I could not get up from that altar and go back knowing what I knew, knowing who died for me, knowing what took place so that I may have life abundantly, that I may have life eternal. I should not live the same way. I die in him, and he lives in me, and I am alive in him again. There has to be a tangible change in our life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, verse 8, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died unto sin once, one time, but in that he liveth and he liveth unto God. Sin no longer had dominion over Christ. If we are baptized in with Christ into his death, sin should no longer have dominion over us. <clears throat> and the only reason that sin would linger in our lives is if we allow it to linger and affect us in our life. Amen? Amen. We have and can possess dominion over the sin that wrecks our life. At Bible study last night around the Burton kitchen table, we began to talk about some secret sins in people's lives. And they said, should I seek somebody for counsel? Should I talk to somebody? I said, well, how long have you been holding on to this? I haven't told anybody about these things. Well, how did you think it was ever going to be dealt with? In my own strength, I could never over overcome it. But there's got to be somebody, and see, I just broke my golden rule. There's got to be accountability. And I don't know who this is for, but the Bible strictly tells us to confess our sins to a brother. You've got to drag that sucker out of the darkness and into the light. That is, the, that is where most of the weight is taken off your shoulders. And when you just simply confess to somebody, they don't have to have all the answers to fix it. They don't have to have uh, all the, 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 the power and the anointing to deliver you right there on the spot. Just get it out. Tell somebody that you can trust what you've been carrying around and get it out there because then maybe they can point you in somebody else that can help you take care of it, be your accountability partner, get you through deliverance, and free you from that dead weight of sin that you've been carrying around for too long and battling in cycles. If it's not for anybody here, I know it's for somebody watching today. We can no longer, in Christ Jesus, accept sin in our life and expect revival and miracles and signs and wonders to flourish in our life. It will not happen. It absolutely cannot. And we see folks, we see a whole entire, we, 
my pastor calls them the earth's church we see Hillsong almost being ripped to shreds and about to cave in on itself because of secret sin this is Hillsong this is the world's church as they call them from Australia all the way around the world they're all over the place some of the most popular pastors to the movie stars every one of them in secret sin and it all just caved in it will find you out my prayer is that it doesn't find you out before you drag it out I want revival I want, sign, I want folks not to throw themselves in my shadow because of anything I've done, but I want to be able to see that, that hope and that glory, that anointing of God completely wreck our communities because we have, we have become more about others and less about ourselves, and we've humbled ourselves to the cross, and the cross has all power over the sin in our life, and sin no longer lingers in us and has dominion over us. When Adam and Eve, the, here, here's a good explanation. When Adam and Eve had communion with God every day, they were at the very top. They were the most dominant force other than God in the garden and in their area at that time. Can we agree on that? Adam named every plant, every animal, everything that was on the earth Adam spoke the name over those things he was the top and when they transgressed and gave that fruit back to Satan that day in the garden they fell all the way to the bottom then they began to feel the weight and the pain of all the sin and the turmoil of the earth and everything began to work against them they realized they were naked they realized they were unrighteous and they hid from God we are sick today because we think we can take our unrighteousness in front of God and he accept it. But thank be to God that he gave us Christ Jesus, that in Christ Jesus we no longer rest here, but we go back up here. We become the dominant force yet again. Because if we're baptized in his death and we're alive in his resurrection he resurrects us back to the heavenly places with God yet we're still functioning here on earth and so miracles, signs and wonders ought to flow through us on the daily it should be the new norm but it's sad that a large percentage today likes to live here I'm not talking today. I, I, can, I, would, I would say that there's probably no lost in the house tonight. Everybody loves Jesus. Anybody watching probably loves Jesus. I'm talking about us tonight, church. We don't want this because we know what it takes to hold this spot. It takes a consecrated lifestyle. It takes a separate lifestyle. It takes a lifestyle of separation from the things of this world that we don't we have to lay our idols down they have to fall they we have to cut their heads off they can no longer possess dominion over our life and we don't it, we have this way of, of not wanting Christ to be the head of everything unless we want him to I would imagine God forbid that that those kids and that baseball diamond somebody is gonna need Jesus this week and maybe it was their parents that began to take life too easy. Maybe it was their parents that no longer sacrificed or humbled themselves to the cross and they began to work things and they began to busy their lives so much that they can no longer fit Christ into their life. That they're so full of themselves that they can no longer make time to pray anymore. They no longer make him the first because they'd rather live down here. I don't know about you. But when I see a miracle take place for somebody, I desire this position. Not that I may have gained, but so that Christ has gained through me. And that others can be affected. I cannot, I, we have to have this, we have to have sin in the center focus. 
Sin must be in our center focus. Dominion in Christ must be in our center focus. Here it says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Don't allow it any space in your life. It cannot acquire territory in your life unless you give it legal ground. Unless you give it legal ground. It does not just step in there and have its way with you unless you give it that spot and that position. God's looking for a church that's pure. Right? Without spot or without blemish. It's pure. He's coming back for that church that's pure. I don't know how many times I've heard it from the last 15 to 16 years that he's coming back for a church without spot or without blemish, but I continue to see a spotted, blemished church. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That means I commit myself, not just, not just my spiritual man, not just my mental self, my physical self, my whole self is committed to God. The, this scripture is asking us, it's telling us not to put ourselves in unrighteous places or to allow ourselves unrighteous things but to separate ourselves from that and give ourselves and declare ourselves unto righteousness. My hands should only touch what is righteous and what is God's and what is rightfully mine. My eyes should only look on things that are righteous. My, my, my mouth should taste his righteousness. My heart should have righteous feelings. My mind should have righteous thoughts. These are the members that he's talking about. This is what he's telling us in this scripture. Because in verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. There again, it tells us that grace is not a free ticket to sin. Grace affords us the ability to live in heavenly places with God, to have him intercede for us, to have Jesus intercede for us daily, and to have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and to hear his voice, and to feel his nudge, that's grace. God telling Noah to shut the door, that was grace. God telling Noah to build an ark, that was grace. That there had to be a separation because what was coming and what was present. And he could not take any old thing on the boat with him. And he warned him, you get on there, you shut it, I'll seal it. That's grace. To be able to hear that and to have that feeling and to lead us. Grace is not so that we can continue to allow sin to have dominion over us and us think it's okay. That's not grace. That's a lie. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Here's the second time. God forbid. God forbid that we do this. God forbid that we continue to sin because we're under grace. We ought to have a revival of holiness. I would love to see a good holiness movement to sweep this world. To where places don't shut down because of some disease or some illness, but places shut down because we've gathered ourselves together to celebrate His holiness more than we want anything else that people finally come back to the church because we, we, are, we are expressing his holiness in our life and there is power in that. 
that there is power, there's life in his holiness and his righteousness. There is a place of rest, there's a place of security, there's a place of sanctity within his holiness and his righteousness. We are servants of his righteousness. We serve. We wait to to be a servant of obedience in his righteousness. We wait upon his righteousness. We we tend to righteousness. We we nurture it. We 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 care for it. We we, we set a table, we prepare a place for his righteousness to come and rest in our individual lives. That is what Romans 6 and 16 is telling us. He says, no, you're not that whom you yield yourselves to servants to obey. His servants are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We are servants of his righteousness. I don't want us to take that for granted. There is something very special that happens in the presence of God when you have made a place for his presence to come down, when you have provided a holy place in our home, when our homes, our bedrooms, our bathrooms, our kitchens, when they're they're a holy place and, and, and we prepare that place for his holiness to be. There's something to be said about that. That's often where we fall apart. That's often where we compromise. And when we rend ourselves to his righteousness in those places, those places are often the starting positions of revival, of of good things. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. <clears throat> For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Are we all clear on what iniquity is? Iniquity is a bloodline issue. It's in the blood. David said, I was a son of a handmaid, and I was birthed in iniquity. That's what David said. Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. A wound is what? It's outward bleeding. A wound is where we cut ourselves. I cut myself a couple times today, ripping up a floor in a customer's house. I bled a little bit. That's a wound outward bleeding. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our sins. He was bruised for what? For our iniquities. What is a bruise? A bruise is internal bleeding. It's where I, where I sucker punch you in the shoulder and it turns purple and green maybe the next day. That's a bruise. That's internal bleeding. He was bruised for that. David said, I was the son of a handmaid and I was birthed in iniquity. What did David struggle with? David struggled with women. What did Solomon struggle with? Solomon struggled with women. Jeez, fellas, what do we struggle with half the time? Women. You got, anybody got that one thing that you can't seem to get away from in your life? That one thing, that's that, that's that, that's that, that dark thing. You can overcome a lot of other stuff. There's always this one thing that keeps creeping its ugly head up in your life. You can take that one thing and you can, you could go back in your history and you could say, dad struggled with this and grandfather struggled with this and great grandfather probably struggled with this and great great grandfather probably struggled with this. Well, the great thing is, is that it can stop with us. It can stop with me and I can pray over my children The blood of Jesus that was bruised for our iniquities never holds dominion. That sin, that iniquity doesn't hold dominion over them any longer. Because Jesus didn't just die for my sins, but he died for what I spread through my bloodline. That's what iniquity unto iniquity means. 
is that we pass it from generation to generation. Even so now, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Maybe there's people that just don't want to give it a shot. And this life is way too hard. This walk ain't for the faint at heart. Anybody that would ever say that it was, was wrong. I never had a natural enemy until I signed up for Jesus. Then they began to come out of the woodworks. It's not an easy walk. And if it was easy, everybody would do this. And if we're serving sin, the Bible tells us that either you're hot or cold. I prefer you to be hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. That's regurgitation. It's vomiting. That's a violent process. He's not just spitting. He's vomiting you out of his mouth. That's an ugly thing. It's a process we don't want. He would rather us just go on and be sinners <laughs> or be on fire for him. And fire ain't easy. I just feel I need to share this. Fire is not easy. To have the fire of God in our life is not a comfortable thing. The fire of God takes a man to a life of repentance and prayer. It keeps a man in right standing with God. It keeps a man on his face for hours at a time, praying and seeking the Lord. The fire is a whole lot more than a dance and a shout. The fire is what keeps us pure. The fire is what keeps us on fire for Him and desiring Him. The Holy Spirit is our comforter through the firing process. Jesus said, I would come. Or John the Baptist said, there's one that comes that's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's two part. Holy Ghost to comfort us, fire to purge us. That's just a side note. <clears throat> what fruit had you then in those things when you were free from righteousness, that you didn't worry about righteousness, but you were free in sin? What fruit is there to live a sin-filled life? What does it produce? The Bible tells us the ways of a man, there's ways that seem right unto a man, and those ways often end in death. There's no fruit in living a life of sin. There's no fruit in running from our calling. There's no fruit in knowing to do good and not to do it. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So should we go on and sin? That grace may abound. Should we continue this life in sin? I have an unpopular opinion, and it is often debated in some of the circles that I'm in. I absolutely believe that we can live a life so pure and so spotless. I believe that we can live a life without sin. I believe it's possible. I don't believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross so that we can continue to live a life even with a little bit of sin. People fight that. Men and women of God fight that idea. I'm a new creature. In a new creation in Christ Jesus, what was once alive is now dead. And what is now alive is not the same person that was dead. I 
if I was reckless because of my drinking, I should never lift up another glass or bottle. If I couldn't stop taking pills, I shouldn't take up another pill. If I partnered those with cigarettes and joints and whatever, that lifestyle changes too. I don't care if it's natural. He wants us to live a life of purity. It's a new life that we have to live. It's a, it's a, it's a place that is safe and protected. When we live a life, it is proven. When we live a life consecrated to God, you and I don't fight the stuff that we often fight. God takes a lot of that for us. He fights a lot of those things for us. We don't have to struggle in the fight. A lot of our struggle is us. It's the things that we allow to happen. It's the places we put ourselves and get ourselves into. It's our attitude. It's our emotions. It's our lust. That stuff can go away today. You don't have to pack that out of here. You don't have to, you don't have to live that life five minutes longer. I believe if, if he has a plan to get us to heaven and we're not quite there yet, then we're not dead, then he's not done. And he's not done with you. And Lord knows he's definitely not done with me. And so today I want to pray for just a little bit. As we wrap this up, maybe tonight, during this Bible study, and I know we didn't crack open words and get into some Hebrew and Greek and break those down, that's typically what we do in our Bible study, maybe tonight you've got that thing, that one thing. And you're tired of carrying it. And maybe you haven't told anybody about that thing. You've fed it, you've nurtured it, but that thing is killing you. That thing is not doing you any good. And maybe tonight you're ready to release it, be done with it, finish the process of dying, finish the process of, of living a life for self and not alive for Christ. Let's finish this process. How long will we be stuck between two opinions? Is what Elijah asked the prophets that day when they were celebrating their idols. How long will we be stuck between two opinions? If God is God, let him be God. If Baal be Baal, let him be God. Those idols never seem to answer the issue. There's only one that does, and his name is Jesus Christ. Today, today you could be free from that. Today you could be free from the torment. Today you could be free from the cycle. The cycle has to break. Today you can take, you can take freedom and dominion over sin in your life, over sin in your children's life, you can take freedom and dominion over that today. Yeah, you don't have to let it go any longer. His promises, yes and amen, his word is true. And he's not dead. Maybe you're here tonight. Maybe you're listening or watching. And so, Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you tonight for the word. We thank you, Lord, that we could open up this word and that still today, over thousands and thousands of years, the word is still effective. That the word still has power. Lord, I thank you 
I thank you for the care. I thank you for the love that you have for us, that we're not alone today, that we're not, we're not by ourselves, even though sometimes we may feel like it, but we're not by ourselves tonight. I'm just going to take a moment and prophesy really quick. If you feel, if you've been feeling like you're alone and that nobody cares and that nobody's watching, I rebuke that right now. I declare tonight that that spirit of loneliness that has plagued your mind, that has wrapped itself around your life, dies tonight. That you are delivered from the spirit of of loneliness that oppression and depression flees now it lifts from you and it goes Christ is our comforter and he's closer than any brother and so as depression as loneliness leaves tonight we release Adoption. We release the family of heaven, the Father, the Son, and His Holy Spirit to completely saturate you. <clears throat> that you no longer walk in loneliness, but you walk in confidence and security to know that you are watched over, you are cared for, and that you have His power to work through you. That you don't have to stay in that place anymore. Maybe that was your thing. You just love to feed the depression. God says, I'll not allow that any longer. Give it to me. Tonight, we don't have to call out that, that secret. But if there's one in your life and you no longer want it, then you say... I just, I just want to be, I just want to be remembered. I just want somebody to pray. I want somebody to care. If that's you, slip that hand up. If that's me. God bless these hands tonight. Not one more day. Not one more day. You hear me? God, I'm asking you right now. Lord, may they walk from this place with empty hands and a pure heart. May they walk from this place tonight, Lord, completely set free and delivered of this one thing that they've carried. Lord, let us let it go tonight. Let us let it go tonight. Enter in, Father, enter in. Fill up the void that that thing has left. May your spirit fill up the void where lust is rooted, where addiction has rooted. Fill up the void, God. Fill up the time. May they not have idle hours anymore, but fill up the time. May there be a new passion and desire to be in your presence and to serve your righteousness. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you tonight. We thank you that your promise gives us hope and joy, gives us a goal, gives us something to desire and to hunger for. May the desire for holiness and righteousness never fade from our hearts, but may that desire ever grow more and more profound with each and every passing day. Not for ourselves, but so that we could change this world, that we could turn the hearts of men, hearts of fathers back to their children, hearts of men back to their communities that families would see revival, that our marriages would see revival.
that sin would not prevent the flow of signs, wonders, and miracles and, and the love of God from working through us and changing things, God. Lord, set us on fire tonight. Burn up this chaff. Burn up the iniquity. Burn up iniquitous structures. Tear them down. In this place tonight. Why not here? And why not now? God help us. Help us God. And Lord we thank you. We thank you for being with us tonight Lord. I thank you for drawing brothers and sisters of like mindedness together. To share in this word and to. To be with one another. Lord as we part we ask you God that you just continue. To stir up a gift within us, stir up a calling within us, stir up our hearts. Lord, I just speak a peaceful evening over each and every person tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you a shout of amen and amen. Lord, we thank you. God bless you all. I was tasked to, I want to make sure that we don't forget this part. Um, for our offering, our tithes this evening I strongly encourage I strongly encourage that you allow the Lord to speak to your heart when giving this is a part two where we often want to say well I don't have a whole lot so I better hold on to what I do have but the Lord is asking tonight that you would trust in him I would suggest tonight that you listen to that voice I would, because you never know what's attached to it. You never know what he's about to release. And oftentimes he wants to, us to give and to release something to him so that he could bring something else in our life. This is not prosperity. This is just the way this works. This is just how he does things sometimes. And I feel like going there. I would encourage you tonight to ask the Lord, Lord, what should I sow? What should I give this evening? You know the nudge. You felt it before. Just operate in obedience to the will of God this evening. Lord, we thank you for the ability to take up this offering for you tonight. Lord, we pray over this offering that it blesses you abundantly, God, because you give so much to us. Let us take this time to give you and to bless the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Uh, thanks for spending some time with me this evening. And uh, thanks for letting me uh, spend some time with you. It's so good to be here again. And uh, we'll be praying for you. Continue to pray for us in Jesus' name.